Transition. Hello, good morning. Uh, this is Cape Canaveral Seafarers Ministry, The Wave. I uh, hope you guys had a wonderful Christmas. Uh, this morning we've got some good music from Wendy, and Josh is going to be bringing our message to us this morning. So before we get started, let's, uh, let's thank God and ask for his blessing upon this. And here we go. Thank you. Father, thank you so much for this morning and for the opportunity to come before you and learn learn your word to praise you, Father. Uh, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for uh, for coming to earth and sharing um, yourself with us, Father, giving us instructions, paying the price for our sins, Father. We praise you and love you and thank you, Father. In your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Wendy. Right. Sing with me, Away in a Manger. Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus lay down his sweet head. The stars in the sky look down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. The cattle are lowing, the poor baby way. But little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. I love thee, Lord Jesus, look down from the sky. And stay by my cradle till morning is nigh. Be near me, Lord Jesus, I ask thee to stay. Close by me forever and love me, I pray. Bless all the dear children in thy tender care. And take us to heaven to live with thee there. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am so happy that I'm here this morning for this chapel because we are starting a new series, a new um, mini series before the new year. And the whole mini series is geared towards one thing, and that's encouragement. And that's what we want to do. We want to land the ship, you know, of this uh, year by encouraging you. You know, it's been a year that has been kind of disappointing. I'm pretty sure that um, nobody thought 2020 was going to be the way that it was, but it is our desire to encourage you. And when we talk to Mark, uh, or whenever Mark and I were talking about, hey, how do we want to end this? What could we do with the days after Christmas? We just got done with the biggest news of the whole year, you know, the biggest point of the whole Bible, God coming into humanity to save us, to reconcile us to him. How do we want to end this? And Mark said, I think we should encourage people because it's been a tough year. So that's what I hope this morning will do. And, you know, my target this morning isn't just to encourage you with God's word, but it's to show you that hope also. And <clears throat> as we kind of think about that, let me start by asking you a question. Have you ever been a part of a commitment speech? Commit a commencement speech, sorry, my words are all sticking together right there, or an address, or been a recipient of a charge? You know, you, you hear these kinds of things in speeches, at weddings, at graduations, and other major events, right? 
It's uh, usually part of a ceremony. But what is the purpose of, of that charge? What is the purpose of doing that? And it's to inspire that group. You know, if it's a graduation, that group of people that just accumulated all this new knowledge, that are all this knowledge they've been working for. If it's a marriage, these two people to, you know, show their love and, and to charge them with, you know, this is something, a commitment that you're making forever, that you will become one. It's it's it is to inspire them to complete a task or to complete a job. Well, today, that's exactly what we're going to see Paul do to the church in Ephesus. So if you have your Bibles, um, if you have one in your heart language, I would love for you to open that up. But we're going to be in Ephesians 4 and um, we're going to look at the first six verses. And now, you know, Ephesians, it is, while, while you're flipping there, it is one of my favorite books in the Bible. It's probably my favorite. And I love it because it's just clear. It's one of those books that Paul just lays out everything um, just very matter-of-factly. They're, he, they're, it's just simple. And that's what I love about it. And the great thing is it's only six chapters long. But in those six chapters, he lays out so much theology and practical, you know, and that's how he breaks it up in the two different sections. If sections one is chapters one through three, and that's like all the things that Christianity is. It is the doctrine of Christianity. It's who we are in Christ. What do we believe about God? And then four through six is Okay, well, if we understand this, how do we live it out? It's the practical side of Christianity. How, how do we live a Christian lifestyle? And so that's why I love this book, because it's just simple. And, you know, <clears throat> with section one, what do we believe about God? Section two, how do we live it out? Now, we have to remember at the same time who this letter is written to. Yes, it is, it is written to us today in, in a way, but there was a specific people group that this was written to, and it was the church of Ephesus. And the last time that we saw the church of Ephesus was actually in the book of Acts, when we were walking through Acts, and I think I actually taught on it. But the church was one of the most, I don't know another word to say, but paganistic um, immoral cities like they had idols for everything um, the main god was artemis and she was seen as the protector of the city and um if you remember there was a riot and one of the silversmiths demetrius he had actually stirred up this riot because people weren't buying his silver idols anymore that he was making because paul was saying god is not a god that is made by human hands and if you remember, that city was flipped completely upside down. Um, it kind of started with the brothers Sceva. If you remember that, they were like this pseudo-Jewish exorcist cult. Um, there's a lot of caveats there, but they were just like a blend of all of the, this idol worship all put together. They would take a little bit from this religion, a little bit here, 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 and they just put it all together. And it was kind of like witchcraft in a way. And they tried to cast out a demon, and the demon beat them up, beat them so bad that they had to run away naked. He beat the clothes off of them. That's a pretty bad beating, right? And when everybody in the city saw this, um, they were wowed um, and, um, because the demon said, Jesus, I know, but you I don't. <laughs> and so they were like, that must be the real God. And the whole city slipped upside down. They end up burning all of these books, like $50 million dollars worth of books that they burn in their streets. The city is turned upside down. And so these are the people that Paul is writing to. They're passionate people, but they needed to be encouraged. You know, they, their whole belief system had just changed. Their whole world had just changed. And so what does Paul do? He encourages them. And that's what I want to do with you this morning. I want us to look at the actual charge that he says. So let's read Ephesians 4, and um, we're going to read the first six verses. And so this is what the word of the Lord says. It says, Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. 
Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and in all and living through all. Such an encouraging um, set of verses. And, you know, I want to break it in to three sections here. We're going to look at the charge, and that's verse one. Then we're going to look at the character of the charge, and then we're going to look at what it means for the church, and that's um, four through six. So one, then we're going to look at two through three, and then four through six. And that's kind of how we're going to break up this section. But the first thing we see is the word therefore. And any time that you find the word therefore in scripture, the first thing that you should do is stop and say, what is it there for? Um, <laughs> just, a, just kind of, uh, it's always a big thing, especially with Paul. Whenever he puts the word therefore, he just finished one argument. And so he's about to really dive in and he's going to really look in on something. So he just closed the um, chapter three with a doxology about G who Jesus Christ is. It's like the crescendo of the book right there about all of this um, theology about who Christ is and what he's done for us. And then he says, therefore, and he starts this way because he wants to charge them with, this is how I want you, or not me, but this is how God wants you to live your life. So um, after, after he explains theology, he gets to that point and he says, this is the key to understanding the Christian life. We can only live rightly when we know our position in the kingdom. And so I think that's a that's a neat thing. You know, he, he goes through theology first so that we understand it. But he, the reason he does that is because if we don't know who God is, if we don't know who we are in Christ, it's like playing chess, but not knowing any of the rules of chess. We're just moving pieces around and hoping that's good. You know, you could have the queen in your hand who is the most powerful piece in the whole game and you could put it where a pawn sits and it could die. And if somebody didn't, if somebody actually knew chess, they would just go after that one and the game would be over in one move. Right. Um, and that that's that's why Paul leads it up is because he wants us to know who we are in Christ so that we can live our life for him. And so not only that, we see the sincerity of what Paul says. He starts with a plea. He says, I beseech you, or in the translation we read, I'm begging you. Think about the word beg. Think about how humble that would be for him to say that to them. You know, this is a guy He's like, I know your life's changed completely. I know that everything in your whole world um, has flipped upside down. I know that you are zealous for the Lord, but this is what I beg you to do to walk in a manner worthy of the calling that you've heard. Walk in a manner that we've just went over for three chapters. And when we, uh, when we understand how much God did for us, we naturally want to obey him with gratitude, right? We don't owe him. We, we, don't, we don't do it out of obligation. We do it out of love. And, you know, I think of Zacchaeus. If you remember Zacchaeus, um, when when he went and climbed the tree to see Jesus, remember he was the chief of tax collectors in one of the richest cities um, in, in Israel, one of the most hated people. But he climbed this tree just to see who Jesus was. And Jesus said, Zacchaeus, today I'm going to eat in your house. And Zacchaeus, what was the first thing he said? He said, I'm going to sell half of everything. He didn't do it because Jesus said, I want to eat in your house. He did it because of his love. Because he said, this guy would recognize me out of this crowd. That's gratitude. And in the same way, that's the understanding of who we are in Christ that allows us to understand how we should live for Christ. Um, it's understanding that we don't have to walk worthy so that God will love us, but because he loves us, the desire is never going to be based on our merit. And so that's, that's the key here. And so therefore, we should carry ourselves accordingly. Actually, Psalms 87, 27 says this, says that God's, uh, every believer is God's firstborn and, uh, and higher than the kings of the earth. 
So Paul starts off encouraging them, begging them, walk in that manner. Walk, walk as, a, as God's firstborn. And so what does that look like? So let's look at verses 2 through 3. What does it say? He starts with lowliness and gentleness. You know, that's not a pushy desire to defend our rights or to advance our agenda. The word is actually one that didn't exist in Greek or Aramaic at the time, the word for lowliness. You know, we, we kind of think of humility, but at that time, lowliness had a bad connotation. Um, it's it. it and it kind of does in today's mindset too, you know, to be low before somebody, you're just going to get stepped on, right? Well, we, when you turn to the Beatitudes, we, we see how Christianity changed that kind of humility, um, changed that what is called in the Beatitudes. And if you don't know what Beatitudes are, that's Matthew chapter 5, the start of the Sermon on the Mount. And the first one and is all these blessed, 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 blessed. Well, there's one that says, blessed are the meek. And what does that word mean? It means submissive, gentle, known for gentleness. Blessed are those who are content and happy when we are not in control, when we're not steering things in our own way, when we don't have the reins of our life, right? And so that's what Paul means is, blessed are those that are humble, that are, I'm sorry, he says, how do you live a Christian lifestyle? You start by a place of humility, by submissiveness, not in a way that is taking advantage of someone, but you start and you see yourself as low because you are seeing things from the perspective of, I am a sinner first, so if anybody does anything against me, then I can say I've been sinned against, but I'm also a sinner, and I know that first. And so what's the next thing he says? He says, do it with long-suffering, bearing together with one another. Long-suffering is having the power to react and not taking advantage of it. You know, if you have any type of relationship in this world with any other person, whether it be dating, marriage, friendship, employee, employer, any type of relationship, you know that wrongs are going to occur. You know, that's just a human thing. We, we make each other mad. Uh, we step on each other's toes. However you want to say that, we, we do it. It happens. There's things that come up that just aren't always pleasant. But the characteristic of long-suffering is forgiving and forgiving with a generous heart. It's not keeping a record of wrongs. You know, it sounds like love when um, Paul describes it in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. But we know the saying Jesus says in the Gospels, you know, he says, take the plank out of your own eye before you take the speck out of somebody else's. And, you know, I always thought about that as like him saying, you know, you take this massive log out of your eye. But I'm just thinking about it from a different way. If, if you have something in your eye, it's going to look huge, right? It's going to look massive because that's all your, that's the lens in which you're going to see something through. So if you are purposely ignoring that to find the smallest little speck in somebody else's eye, that's what Jesus is saying here, and it's that kind of meekness that allows us to be long-suffering. It allows us to keep the unity of the Spirit in what he talks about. You know, it's, it's seeing that, man, my sin is, is, is greater than whatever they've done against me because my sin is against the Holy God, and it doesn't matter about what they've done to me because my vertical is way more important than anything that could happen on this, hori this horizontal relationships with other human beings. And so I think it's interesting that, you know, we must keep this unity. That's what he says. We're, you know, God never says, whenever we look at these verses in two or three, he, he says this, he says, make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together in peace. Not once does Paul say, you know, you need to create this unity. He says, keep it. The unity is already there. Um, God never commands us in any scripture to keep unity. His spirit, the Holy Spirit, what indwells the believer 
It's our duty to recognize it and to keep it. That's what binds us all together as brothers and sisters in Christ. That's how we live. We live in humility, with long suffering, by the prompting of the Holy Spirit. That's what it means to live a life for Christ and to stay connected to him. And then the third thing is that we see the church. We have this unity because of one thing, God, in our individual and corporate relationship to the one and only triune God. Our unity is best represented in our individuality as a family. So what I'm trying to say there is, you know, like we see God best by all of our personalities. You know, Dean, that opened us up, is genuinely one of the nicest people I know. Richard at the ministry, very wise. Every time I talk to Richard, I, I feel like I'm smarter. Mark, he would do anything for anyone. One of the most humble people I know. But when we see those characteristics, they stand out and they they should point us toward Christ, right? They, they should. When you look at it and say, man, that is what that guy is. How great is God? And so with that in mind, you know, that's why God gave us different attributes. And we're going to kind of see this picture of the Trinity right here with all of these ones that they say, you know, one baptism, one faith, one Lord. We're going to see this beautiful picture of the Christ. And this is what we actually see. We see one spirit that we have unity because we all share in the common body of believers. We all have the same spirit of God indwelling us. It's not different measures, not different. God doesn't have multiple spirits. God is three persons in one being. So he's one, one God with three personhoods. And the second one is our one Lord. And so that's Jesus Christ. Our hope and our calling are based on what Jesus did on the cross. What he did with his life and his resurrection and the fact that he'll be coming back. And then the third thing is the one father. Our faith, our belief, our Shema as we will move into um, Deuteronomy at the new year in chapter 6. Um, that's something to look forward to. And our baptism is putting feet to that belief. And so I second Paul here. I implore you today, encouraging you to walk in a manner worthy that God's called you. Understanding that the gospel is the measure of our life. It's not just our desires and things. God gives us healthy desires, but the gospel should be the measure of our lives. Not what other people are doing, not you know what other people are talented about, but what has God gifted you with and how can you use it for the kingdom? Because that's all that matters. If we measure ourselves against other human beings, that's always a losing game. You know, I, I wrote down here that that um, when we uh, let, let the gospel um, guide our life, we don't see Jesus as the star that we put on top of the Christmas tree or an ornament that we just add on. He becomes the Christmas tree. He is everything. So if Jesus is our Lord and Savior, he is our sole purpose for our lives. So let your life shine. That's my encouragement this morning, especially now. Now in a time where people are hurting, they're lonely, they're separated from their loved ones, they might be depressed, they're bitter that everything's gone differently than what they could have planned. Love them with long suffering and let your testimony be of God's grace and God's mercy. So that's my encouragement for this morning. I hope that it encourages you. I'm going to pray us out. So if you would, bow your heads with me, and we will go on from here. Dear Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for your um, just your grace and your mercy, God, your encouragement. The fact that we can go to your word, open it up, and that you have something new for us every day, even if it's a passage we've seen a hundred times. And Lord, I pray that um, as, you know, I'm sure people are traveling around, um, coming home, 
from Christmas um, with their families or um, you know other situations. God, just pray for safety and peace as they're doing that. Lord, we thank you for today. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, we'll see you next time.